Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for making time today to join us for our Grid Talks webinar. Uh, today, we will be talking about women in construction. So we are going to raise the roof and talk about women in construction. And we are going to be asking, what does an inclusive solar industry look like? So I'm thrilled to he be here today to facilitate. Uh, my name is Lisa Lembruni. I am Senior Director of Marketing and Communications Operations at Gridcom HQ. And um, yeah, I welcome everyone. It's so great to see you adding your names in the chat where you're from. We're so thrilled that you're here. So I'm excited because this is our second webinar in the Grid Talk series that we just kicked off last month with Jackie Patterson. Um, we're going to be passing the mic around, obviously, to different guests each month and different hosts. So Carol Bernard kicked us off last month, and I'm thrilled to be here today to um, talk about women in construction. So what the seminar series, what we hope to be doing with it, is basically bringing together leaders from the renewable energy field and the environmental justice space. Um, we wanted to be discussing clean energy access community-centered solutions, and to amplify all of the voices from all of the communities and all of the unique experiences in this space and sort of share all of the good work everyone is doing. So before we get started and before I introduce our panelists, um, I'm just going to do a little bit of a logistics overview. Um, so for one, as you've probably noticed, this webinar is going to be recorded. Um, you are not on camera, but your chats won't, won't be a part of it unless you ask a question and we answer that question. So just know that your question might be recorded. Um, I'll be reading it, um, so just as an FYI. Um, and then your video and audio will be muted, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, <laughs> that's taken care of. So if you have questions for our panelists, we are going to reserve the final 15 minutes to go through those. So make sure that when you have a question, you type it into the button that says Q&A, right? Make sure you're typing it into the Q&A box, not the chat. Um, but if you do, put it in the chat. We have some folks from HQ Comms who will remind you to pop it over there in the Q&A. Okay. Um, and afterwards, when the recording is complete, we will be sending out an email with a link so that you can re-watch it again in the future and share it with others as well. All right, so without further ado, let's get to today's event. Um, I'd like to introduce our panelists to go ahead and turn your camera on. Um, and while you're doing that, I'll give a brief introduction. We have Marie Kills Warrior, Energy Research and Project Developer from 8th Fire Solar. We also have Frida Galindo. She's a Solar Core Fellow from Grid Greater Los Angeles. And we have Anna Bautista, VP of Construction for Grid Alternatives. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Now, before we hop into the questions and hear from you, I'm going to provide just a brief overview of why we're here today and why we selected this topic. So first, According to the U.S. Solar Industry Diversity Study, women represented only 26% of the solar workforce in 2019. And other data highlights similar gender disparities. Only 28% of women in the solar industry hold manager, director, or presidential level positions, and the differences are even more stark for women of color. And of course, at the same time, we have the Inflation Reduction Act, right? This is poised to truly accelerate our transition to clean energy and providing billions of dollars for the transition that we all hope to see and that are working so hard for. Um, but what are we going to do, right? How can we scale up to meet this challenge um, in an equitable way and to ensure that the growing solar industry is done in, a, you know, in a, an inclusive way? And as a part of Women's History Month, we thought it would be a great opportunity to hear from the women who are on the front lines of the solar construction industry. So to hear from you three in terms of what it's like there, what's going on, what are you doing to help make this a more inclusive space, what are the challenges you've faced, how have you overcome them, and where are we going from here? So with that, I'd love to now talk to each of you and just get a brief introduction. So tell us just a little bit more about your current role um, and what do you do in the solar industry? What does your day-to-day uh, -day look like? Just to give a, um, a sense to folks who might not have familiarity. 
So why don't we start with um, you, Marie? Yeah, no problem. Um, so Marie Kills Warrior and kind of my day-to-day -day role is one, I kind of look for available funding for a couple of projects that we have going on here in the White Earth Reservation and trying to get a, a um, K through eight school, a solar PV system with battery energy storage for a resiliency hub for the wider community or Pine Point community. And kind of just basically, it's a lot of communication with different people that are a part of this project. That's great, thank you. Um, Frida, why don't you share a little bit about yourself? Hi. Um, firstly, I just really want to thank everyone for having me here and helping me get involved. I'm really, really happy to be here and just like so honored to be talking with such powerful women. Um, so I'm a Solar Core Project Management Fellow, and I spend about a quarter of my time uh, practicing design and working closely with like our lead designer at the GLA office. And then the rest of my time, um, I focus on getting solar permits for uh, residential projects that have made it past the first few hurdles of the process. So this means just a lot of um, working with the cities to get permits and get projects going on their on their path. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. And go ahead, Anna. Hey, folks, I'm Anna Bautista. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the vice president of construction at GRID. Um, I'll first just give you a brief overview of what, what my department does and then what my specific hat is, just in case folks aren't familiar. And so GRID is the largest uh, nonprofit um, installer, solar installer in the United States. And so we're a project developer and an EPC, EPC meaning we contract out, we are a contractor for engineering, procurement and construction services. Um, and we have includes a lot of technical and operational functions. So there's safety, project management, operations and maintenance. Um, we also do technical training. We do a lot of different technology. So we do solar storage, EV chargers. Um, we do electrical upgrades and we cover across, we cover a bunch of different scales from single family and multifamily residential to commercial microgrids, community solar. And then we're also across geographies in the United States and international. So that being said, I'm no longer a subject matter expert. There's just too many things to have to know. And so these days I'm not in the weeds. I haven't run a job site in about three years. So I'm not building projects, but my work now is being a people manager. So I'm still building teams and making sure that the work is resourced um, and that my team has what they need to do their job. So they have tools, materials, training, um, and I help problem solve around obstacles. So I'd say that's my, my biggest hat. That's great. That's a lot. That's exciting. So as a part of the introduction, I thought it would also be great to share with everyone how you came to work in the solar industry, because sometimes we follow very odd paths to get where we are. So it's also a nice way to introduce a little bit more about you to everyone listening as well. So um, why don't we go around again? Marie, why don't you start us off? Yeah, no problem. So I basically got introduced to solar PV at an Earth Day install back on, back home on um, the Pine Ridge Reservation at Thunder Valley. And Sun Power actually came out and I knew what solar PV was, but I wasn't aware of what it can actually do. And they really showed us like an in-depth um, kind of a little workshop of what a, how the solar cells make up a solar module and how the solar modules react to the sun's photovoltaics, the photons, and went into like the different racking that went in along with it during the installation. And from there, I kind of, you know, just like got really, really into it. And they offered me to do some classes at uh, Solar Energy International. And from there, I kind of went on and really just got the, got the hang of it, fell in love with it, still pursuing it. And then, uh, shortly after, then that's whenever I had decided to pursue solar PV as a career and jumped on with GRID's uh, tribal program down in Denver. It's awesome. I mean, who would have guessed, right? Starting off just at an Earth Day event like that, it just sort of paved the way for something entirely new. That's thrilling. Uh, go ahead, Frida. Okay, um, so I had just graduated from college. Um, with a major in environmental studies and a major in global studies. And um, my main thing was I just knew I wanted to make a difference. I, I really wanted to 
um, positive impact, you know, my own community and everything. And so then it wasn't, um, I was just kind of working a lot of odd jobs, um, multiple just food industry, everything. I was just doing everything I could. <laughs> and then um, and then I found Grid and um, I'm always looking for opportunities to learn and challenge myself. And um, yeah, so then that's when I applied for the fellowship and here I am now. And I just, yeah, I could have never imagined, but I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Go ahead, Anna. Um, I'll start my story by saying that um, I'm the, the child of uh, two immigrants from the Philippines. Um, and the Philippines is a, it's a U.S. neo colony that maintained U.S. bases. And so my father was able to um, sponsor our family's immigration by joining the U.S. Navy. Um, and those sacrifices allowed me a Western education. So I was very privileged to study electrical engineering at MIT. Um, and after I graduated, I was finally able to return to my family homeland um, on an environmental justice tour. And there I witnessed um, activists, community leaders who were fighting against the extractive global economy. So, you know, fighting against oil depots, multinational companies, toxic factories, landfills, military dumps. Um, and so when I returned stateside, I had this electrical engineering degree, I had a new passion for environmental justice. Uh, so I was inspired to change energy infrastructure. Um, my first solar job was in the mid 2000s and it was like, that's a very like romantic like origin story, but my first solar job in solar was not very romantic. I was an entry level installer. On my first day I was digging trenches. We had a gas line. Back then we were not doing safety at all. Um, and all the, our clients were folks who could afford solar and they had access to wealth. They had horse stables, tennis courts, car elevators, helicopter pads. Um, but at the time I just took it as this was my time to skill build. So building my skills around installation, design, project management, um, business development. And I was lucky to have uh, the director of operations as my sponsor and took me on as his number two. Um, and uh, so I could uh, develop my skills that way. Um, but again, it wasn't connected to the communities that I cared about. and. Uh, my partner happened to send me an article by Van Jones in the LA Times about green jobs and green economy, and it prompted me to look up grid alternatives again. I had heard about them as a nonprofit in the field, and they were opening up an LA shop. And so um, I joined that founding team, and I helped start up that office in 2008, and I've been with Grid ever since, which is wild. Um, but yeah, so I've been serving the sun now for uh, 18 years. I love that serving the sun. <laughs> well, that sort of is a nice segue to our next question. And I'm really curious to just get a, a sense of really what motivates you all to do this work. Like, why are you in the solar industry? Really? Like what brought you here? And now where, are, where is this going for you? Why are you motivated to do this work? And go ahead. We'll, we'll just stick with the same order um, for simplicity. So go ahead, Marie. Alrighty, so one is that I kind of started off as like as an installer and then kind of, you know, going around with the, the tribal program through GRID and going out and helping different um, indigenous communities wanted to Im implement more solar PV within the reservation. And from there, you know, it's kind of still like my little mantra is that I still want to help a lot of um, indigenous folks that don't know about solar and how it works or how to even get access to it. And I also um, want to become a designer, which is kind of like one of the roles that I also play at the moment is, you know, designing some solar systems up here. But I also come from a long line of educators. My mom was a Lakota language teacher. My, my auntie, she taught, uh, she's a retired elementary school teacher. My cousin's, you know, middle school math teacher, my cousin food sovereignty teacher, my uncle is an automotive teacher. So basically a line of educators runs in my blood and I kind of decided to stick with that same, that same path, but kind of have my own trail when it comes to solar PV and teaching how to install, and, you know, teaching people how to, how to um, get more, uh, raise more awareness about solar. 
That's awesome. And that truly is an educator family. That's a lot. That's great. <laughs> uh, go for it, Frida. Um, like I had mentioned, um, I really I'm very passionate about the environment and, you know, with everything that's going on in the world, it can feel like it can just feels so daunting, um, you know, trying to uh, solve the climate crisis and everything. It's just there's so many things going wrong everywhere you look. And so like being able to be part of the solar industry, like it just feels like I'm like contributing to something bigger than myself. I'm just able to, you know, be part of these projects that um, just get us like one step at a time, get us uh, closer to just helping the environment. You know, it's 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 just very rewarding work. And um, I feel like I feel like I'm making a difference. So that's what really that's what, you know, really gets me so. That's awesome. Yeah, you totally get something for giving in this sense. Yeah. Go ahead, Anna. Um, I would say that my core identity is a builder, but like in the general sense of the term. And so, um, yes, like I, I think I'm good at building solar projects and building teams and building learning spaces. Um, I'd say kind of the broader sense of why I'm doing this work, like similar to what Frida was um, naming around just the problem, the big problems we're trying to solve. Um, I, I think of it as a um, working towards a just transition. And that really is at least what I feel like is our work to do in this time. Like we know the extractive economy is not serving us. Um, and in order to get to a more inclusive life-giving economy, like we have to build it now. Like we can't like wait for like revolution or it's like we need to just start building and practicing like what we need for that world. And so, um, so yeah, so I think solar is my practice space um, in terms of uh, building a building towards a just transition. That's great. I love that mantra. We need to build it now. Just, just, just do it right now. <laughs> That's perfect. Everyone's totally nodding in agreement. Great. All right. So now we're going to start to get into some of the little bit more challenging section, you know, of our talk today, which is, of course, as I mentioned in the introduction, there's only a small percentage of women working in the solar construction industry, solar industry. And so really, there's a lot of challenges that women in this field face. So I wanted to take a little bit of time to unpack that and to just hear your experiences. So for instance, what preconceptions or assumptions did you face? Um, what challenges have you overcome? And it'd be great for folks to hear really like how you responded or, or how you overcame those. So just unpacking that in your own way would be um, really helpful. Um, so uh, go ahead, Marie, I'll hand it over to you again to start. So I guess some of the um, challenges that I had to overcome, one was that Whenever I stepped on uh, stepped on the roof with a certain uh, a certain company at the time, was there was like a lot of mansplaining and like there was a lot of downplaying about the knowledge and the experience they already had, and especially like whenever I wanted to implement some safety measures for myself, you know, I was kind of looked down upon, and and kind of always had to like work twice as hard, you know, just to try to you know get into good graces of the lead at the moment. But even then, I kind of just, you know, expand my knowledge at the moment, you know, I have to, you know, practice my patience and kind of do some things on my own in order to just try and keep get the job done and keep up my uh, myself up in good hopes. So that's kind of like how I did and how I kind of overcame some of those uh, challenges at that time. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And um, Frida, how about you? I know, mute myself. Um, <laughs> um, for me, it's just been, um, thankfully I haven't faced, you know, too much um, of it in this role, but um, being just like going to city, different city halls, um, being there and being kind of, you know, often the only, the only woman uh, on the other side of the desk, um, it can be kind of intimidating. Um, it's usually uh, older men and um, in some of the cases it's, majority older white men. So, you know, it can be, uh, like I said, just a little intimidating and overcoming this. Um, I think my biggest thing has just been kind of, 
acting confident, you know, I might not have felt my most confident, but that was a bit, that's kind of how I, you know, just, I guess, faking till I make, faking it till I make it. But, you know, the thing is, is that I, I'm not faking it. I do know what I'm talking about. So it's just kind of having to remind myself, like, we know what we're doing here. So um, that's been a lot of uh, how I've overcome that. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, Anna, go ahead. Um, there's like studies about why there aren't women in the trades and I'll just name like some of the, you know, the, the patterns that they're seeing in terms of like, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll connect how I'm relating to it, but you know, in terms of exposure, it's like, we're just not exposed to it in earlier careers as, as, as it being an option. And then once we are on the path, either training or in it. Um, we might not have as much access to the networks or the jobs. Um, uh, sometimes I've heard from some folks saying that they have to like fight to make space for themselves in a training space or on the job. Um, uh, Marine named around like health and safety concerns. And so when is there even safety? And then if there is safety, does the PPE fit me? Do I have a harness that fits me, gloves that fit me? Um, uh, exposure to mentoring and opportunities to to learn more about the job, um, and then unfortunately there's like you know um, uh, um, more more serious things like harassment, discrimination, um, bias, um, and I'd say for myself I've been really lucky that I've only experienced microaggressions, and microaggressions don't doesn't mean that it's small. It's like death by a thousand cuts, right? It's it's more meaning that it's more happening at the interpersonal level. Um, so I've had, you know, um, going to meet inspectors or going to meet other uh, uh, clients or partners and they go to shake my male colleagues hands first and they're like, they're like, actually, she's the boss. Um, and, um, you know, there can be jokes on the job sites that I've had to interrupt either um, homophobic jo jokes or sexual jokes. Um, but I've been very lucky that um, uh, it's been more on the microaggression level. Um, I used to wear a wedding ring on job sites so that, I, um, like, I feel like it has impacted, like, my gender presentation. Um, uh, it's like, I'm here to work. I'm here to learn. I'm not here looking for a date. Um, and so in terms of like having to put in measures to restrict unwanted attention um, uh, is like extra emotional labor <laughs> that a lot of women have to do on jobs. Um, but yeah, I'll just, I'll pause there. Well, thank you. Thank you all for sharing this. I know this is difficult stuff to dive into and like, it, but you face it all the time. So it's so important to, you know, let everyone know that this is what the reality is like. And I just, you know, commend you all for working and actually making it an inclusive space by you just being there and showing up and, and doing the work. And we'll get into more like what we can do to support women in the field. Um, but I want to just go a little deeper first and just sort of check in like, you know, with these types of challenges, like you said, the death by a thousand cuts, um, you know, what can the impact be for women who are in this space who face some of these challenges, either that you've experienced or that you've seen? Um, yeah, what, what does that impact look like? Um, and I guess I'll hand it over, yeah, Marie, to you again. So kind of how it was is that although I had both the experience and the knowledge because um, I had really great mentors coming up in the construction industry, like they're really good, you know, taught us how to read a tape, taught us, you know, like how how the rafters are spaced and they never put us in a situation that we were uncomfortable with, like they understood that. And so that's why I kind of held like that type of safety and that concern to every other organization and company that I went to. And although some of the companies, um, they didn't acknowledge that I still had those experience and the knowledge um, they just kind of didn't really, really accept me that the fact that I was a woman and, you know, Native American that I, and that I was on the roof and, you know, I was still being looked down on, although, and I also was also receiving, you know, like backhanded comments as well. And so I guess that's kind of, and it kind of like really lowered my self-esteem and it kind of like really made me begin to like doubt myself and ask and question, like, if I really wanted to continue on you know my my path of solar pv and so it's kind of kind of like how it made me feel at the moment but you know i guess with the mentors that i have in my life they were kind of 
you know, like the backbone and always supporting me and always talking through things and always wanting me to keep moving forward. And so that's kind of where, where I'm at at the moment. I'm really um, thankful that I have those people in my life that, that support me in the ways that they do. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's, that's wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, go ahead, Frida. Um, for me, it's just been kind of, um, I feel like I need to be extra sure that I know what I'm doing and that I know uh, what I'm talking about. Um, it's kind of like this feeling like I have to prove myself, um, which is just kind of unfortunate. You know, I don't think you know, everybody is allowed to have questions and not know something. But for me, it's like almost if I don't know, it's like, okay, well, it makes sense why you don't, you know, like, it's just, it's, it's kind of, yeah, for me, it's just been a lot of um, this, like, I need to prove that I know what I'm talking about. Because if I don't, then I don't know, you know, I just, I'll lose like respect or something. So um, that's just been like the kind of what I've uh, faced just because, yeah, just getting those looks when I walk in, it can be kind of, ooh, so yeah, that's for me. Yeah, thank you, Frida. Go ahead, Anna. Yeah, I'm just shaking my head to what Marie and Frida are saying. And I think what I'll add is that um, what I've seen a lot consistently is internalized imposter syndrome in terms of an impact. So imposter syndrome, meaning that a lot of women uh, it's like a sense that they don't deserve to be there, that like everyone else around them worked harder and deserves to be there and that they didn't or that they don't. Um, and yeah, like I, I think for me, like I joke that like progress for me is like when I can just be like mediocre in this industry, <laughs> like that's like a sad like goal is like, when can we just like do our job, like our basic job and not have to be extra. Yeah, a hundred percent, right? It's just so much extra work that one would have that has to do. But I just want to say, I know maybe you haven't been looking at the chat, but you've been getting so much, much kudos for sharing your stories and just what this experience has been like. So thank you again for opening and just opening up and sharing this. And um, it's really, yeah, it's great for people to just know what it's like. Now we can transition a little and sort of Marie to what you were saying is that you had this mentor, which was this wonderful experience that sort of like helped you continue in this path to follow, you know, your passion and with this being a part of this field. And so I'm curious, like, what kinds of support do you think we all can provide um, to women who are trying to make a career in this field? So yeah, Marie, I'll hand it over to you first. So it was just basically kind of having, you know, that that really good and caring and loving support group that you have. And you're going to meet these people along this journey that you're creating, this journey that you're on. And so <clears throat> with the mentors that I have, they were kind of, you know, like, like you like you like you've really come a long way. It's like it's going to be challenging. You are you ready to, you know, like come up to it. it's like you're gonna have to stand up to your stand up for yourself you're gonna have to keep your head up and not down you're gonna have to keep looking for um, brighter days and kind of you know like just take a step back and breathe because there's gonna be a point when you're gonna have to be the one that's gonna rise above that negativity not to give them their energy whenever they try to come back with the backhanded comments and to also you know to be that person that you wish you had whenever you were younger and I kind of remember that whenever you know because I have worked with um, some individuals that were you know a little bit say kind of they were kind of shy you know kind of you know take my take my first foot forward and help them to understand you know like how to land wires and kind of show them like how it's done and then let them go ahead and do, do their thing and of course I would be right there beside them through the process of it all but just try to just try to be that support person um, whenever you can the best way you know how that's great yeah thank you go ahead Frida um, I can I completely agree with Marie um, it's really big on just I mean what I think um, 
is just, you know, creating that welcoming environment and just encouraging one another and everything and trying to support one another through all of this. And um, knowing that, you know, we do face some of the some of the similar challenges and everything and kind of trying to connect on that. And, you know, like Marie said, rise, rise above it and everything. And um, yeah, I just yeah, I think I, I had I have a mentor right now and um, it's been really encouraging, you know, because she really I mean, she really gets things done. So it's so cool getting to see someone, you know, rise like that high and do so much for uh, for grid and just for her community and everything. It's it's inspiring to me. And, you know, it's really just encouraging. Um, yeah. And I think I think, yeah, as long as, you know, um, also being aware of the people that are invited into, you know, to work for GRID and everything, you know, making sure that, you know, those people, um, that their missions align with GRID's mission statement, you know, just kind of in, ensuring that that environment is going to be, you know, agreed on, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, I'll just stop there. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Frida. Go ahead, Anna. Uh, yeah, I, my first SEI class was in 2005, and it was led by two women who I still consider are my mentors. So I was lucky that very early on, um, there are folks who were telling me that like I could be successful having this as my career. So if y'all don't have a role model, I, I see two on the screen up here with me. Um, so I think the role models are important. I think um, I think. Uh, Oh, I'm going to do a plug too for uh, for Marie. Um, Marie's in this book, Everyday Super. Oh, my my. Um, I have to turn off my uh, my filter. Um, is in this book, Everyday Superheroes: Women and Energy Careers, and um, she has this awesome spread, like this like cartoon of, of her installing solar. So I think just role models are really important. Um, mentors which have been named already. There are organizations besides GRID. Um, there's RISE. They have a peer mentorship program. I participate in that. I think it's really important to have safe places to ask business questions and technical questions. Um, women in construction operations is another one in California that some of us participate in. Um, there are safe learning spaces like GRID and Solar Energy International. Um, I run the affinity group for women and non-binary genders in construction at GRID. Um, and we do both um, check-ins as well as opportunities to do skill building. So again, a safe place for people to ask questions. Um, and then, but what I tell people like, in terms of like, so that's like the support, but what I tell people in terms of like what, you know, I'm paying it forward because I am now in a place of, place of privilege. I'm like at an executive level, like I have a responsibility to do that. But for like everybody else, I'm like, your job is just to survive the day. You know, it's like, remember your why. <laughs> Uh, why are you in this industry? And, um, you know, just continue, you know, your why, what your goals are and continue on that path of learning. Um, and, you know, and at this time at night, it's, it's not, it might not be your work to like take on that emotional labor in terms of like creating support for other people. You know, it's like at this point, like you said, Lisa, like it can just be enough to like be in the industry right now. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. And oh my goodness, Marie, you have like a cartoon character in a book. For, that's amazing. Like, that, I'm sorry that I just have to make note of that. That's adorable. <laughs> but this is great. I mean, in all the resources that you all have created and that you, you know, have had for yourself, this is, it's just really great and amazing to hear. Um, so a little bit more in this vein, um, going back to sort of the context setting we did at the beginning with the Inflation Reduction Act, right, this workforce is going to have to scale up really quickly. So how are we going to start to bridge this gap, right? Some of the stuff we're talking about, but how do we do it if the workforce is going to be expanding so quickly, so soon? Um, you know, what really needs to shift in the industry to make it an inclusive space? Um, you sort of touched on it a little bit, but it could be at any level interpersonally, at an organization or even at a city or county level, just depending on where your um, uh, your experience is. So yeah, what, what needs to change to make this shift possible in an inclusive way? So I actually had a discussion with, um, with one of our uh, partners down in the Twin Cities. And we were talking about one, we have all of these amazing, you know, uh, opportunities for solar PV to come to a life, whether it's on a res residential level or a commercial level. 
One is that the money that that's out there that's available now, it can go all towards renewables. But the fact is, is that one, we want, we have all these dreams for all these projects to come alive, but do we actually have the workforce to, to do this? Uh, so we kind of had like this in-depth conversation on, on how we, you know, as, as leaders and as organization can continue to do this work and to ensure that we have the workforce available. One, we kind of talked about uh, definitely like people putting in some like volunteering gigs. And so that's kind of like what I had asked about, like, you know, I can do a little bit of, I can, I can help with that, getting people introduced to solar and kind of, you know, know my way around the roof. And I would be honored if I was able to pass the opportunity that was presented to me when I first started and keep that, keep the opportunity going. So definitely working together and creating this, uh, this workforce that can, that can be created and also to ensure to include like other, you know, BIPOC communities, because there are some communities that are not allowed to be in the same room as a man that they are not married to. But that doesn't, should, that should not mean they're excluded from the roof. So definitely incorporating more women as instructors and as installer leads and those, and especially women who are open to leading those groups will definitely open, you know, the doors for diversity, for inclusion, then of course, you know, for equality and to create this, you know, workforce. And then plus, you know, I, I like to, being an educator, I would like to teach, you know, everybody that, that is under the sun because, you know, that's what we need. We all live under it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Marie. Go ahead, Frida. Um, I think it's just, um, I think it's important for uh, companies to keep doing, um, you know, to follow, you know, what GRID is doing, you know, having all of those mission statements, you know, and, you know, sticking to it and just encouraging other communities and companies to do that, you know, because that, I feel like that's really created such a welcoming space and that's what, you know, um, people are attracted to that, like-minded people are attracted to that, so, you know, the more the more, you know, you encourage that and everything, I think it will, you know, help to create more of an inclusive space. Um, I know that that can be a little, you know, idealistic, but I feel like, I feel like it's actually, you know, quite simple just to kind of just, I don't know, just keep encouraging that and just um, also, you know, continue with mentorship programs and just, um, yeah, just really encouraging confidence in women and the fact that, you know, we are exactly the same and we can do the same things, you know, even better sometimes. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's just very important to um, keep doing that and hopefully other companies will also do that and follow our lead, so. That's great. Thank you, Frida. Go ahead, Anna. Um, I'm going to answer this question at the organizational level and try to offer some solutions for small and then mid to large companies because I, I, I recognize that depending on how big your company is depends on how much resources you have and so at least for small companies I feel like the bare minimum is like, you know, do you have your anti harassment training and bias training like that's like the bare minimum, um, you know, hopefully you have like an HR, HR resource or able to outsource the HR resource or there's a mechanism. So if folks do need to escalate things, there's mechanisms for that. I think the naming your values, like similar to what Frida was saying is uh, in terms of like a mission statement, but just a value statement that you value safety so that like Marie doesn't have to come out to your job site and be like, uh, do I get a harness on this job? Um, um, so I think those are like, low hanging fruit if you don't have a lot of resources is good for small companies. For mid to large companies, I think training and concrete pathways are gonna be what's critical. Um, and I think for us, um, so great, we're not just an installer, but we're also a workforce um, uh, develop, development training uh, organization. Um, <clears throat> um, like we're looking at the ecosystem of what it takes for training, because we have to triple our workforce in the next 10 years. And so like there's there's different parts to play in the ecosystem. There's 
people who can recruit folks like in accessible way, wraparound services for, uh, for trainees, um, people who can do training either classroom, lab in the field, and again, in a, an accessible way, um, and then on the job training. And so it's like our strategy is going to be partnering um, with kind of our core expertise being doing the hands on training. Um, but uh, yeah, I think kind of like to what Marie said, I think the education piece and the training piece is 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 what we have to figure out in order to to uh, grow the industry. Yeah, absolutely. This is great. So many amazing recommendations. And I know there's a lot of folks in the chat who are just like loving all this. So um, this is great. Um, I'm going to do one final question for me to wrap us up and then we'll spend the last 10 minutes with some questions from the audience. Um, and it's basically do you what do you have in terms of advice for any woman looking to get into the field? Um, I will I will start this off with just three short lines that I sort of <laughs> extracted from things you've said that I think are great. Rise above it, build it now, serve the sun, <laughs> sort of to distill it in some main points, but I'm sure you can say a whole lot more. So yeah, what, what kind of advice could you provide anyone looking to uh, get into the field? So I guess one is kind of just, you know, be ready for a different kind of experience, more of like on seeing something go from paper and you can actually bring it to life with either, you know, the same day or the days to come. And I guess just keep being, um, yeah, just keep being open to the opportunities that are out there. And, you know, if you, if you ever feel like you're uncomfortable or if you ever feel like there's somebody who is mistreating you, then, you know, you're gonna have to, you know, I don't know speak up, talk to them how you would like to be addressed and two, just keep your head up, keep moving forward. And if everybody else can do it, then then you can do it too. That's great. Uh, go ahead, Frida. Um, I would I would say um, kind of what I tell myself sometimes is just you know remember why you're here, remember the why, like you know remember what you're passionate about, and you know that'll take you. You know. Um, yeah, definitely just remembering why you're here. That'll help you get through it, take things one step at a time. Um, and then just, yeah, continue to take things one day at a time, you know, address each challenge as it comes. Don't worry about what's going to happen. Just focus on the now. Um, yeah, maybe that's a little bit more life <laughs> advice, but it can be applied to solar and jobs too. So <laughs> yeah, one day at a time, one challenge at a time. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Frida. And go ahead, Anna. I think my advice is going to be more practical. Um, if you've got a local RISE chapter, start showing up there, getting to know other women in the in the field in, in your local space. And then um, if you're able to start going to conferences, um, Inner Solar was in was in Long Beach last month. Um, RE Plus is a big one that I think is in Vegas later this year. Um, if you're able to take a take a class either at your local community college or online, SEI has been named. I want to shout out HeatSpring. I saw Britt in the audience who was a former gritter, now works at HeatSpring, also does online classes. Basically on day one, when we do our training, we teach you language. And so it's like, start to learn the language of solar. So then you can start to participate more and more in these spaces and y'all can, you can speak the same language. That's great. Thank you so much. This is awesome. And again, thanks for your responses to all these questions. And it has got a lot of questions and comments going. So let's turn to the Q&A and we'll get through as many as we can in the final 10 minutes. And whoever wants to jump in from the panelists, feel free. You don't all have to weigh in if you don't want to, but you're welcome to. Okay, so the first question that we're going to answer is from Kristen. And she's wondering what your experience with apprenticeships or public training programs has generally looked like? And what opportunities do you see? I think I could touch on that one real quick. So I'm actually beginning to go more into like the pre-apprenticeship pre kind of space now. And 
one definitely first like starting off with introducing to people you know kind of nitpicking off of what you guys do what SCI does is telling you know like the basics of the basics of electricity and how it kind of all ties in into you know solar and how that process um kind of creates an even bigger project but definitely you know being a being prepared to be able to answer questions clearly in a manner that the uh, the pre apprentices will understand and that will hang on to and that is going to benefit them moving forward in the field. I'll add that I personally have not gone through a pre apprenticeship training or an apprenticeship training program. Uh, I recognize that like my pathway is a little bit unusual and if I was starting over today, I would probably go more the pre-apprenticeship or apprenticeship route. Um, there's, uh, I know at least one pre-apprenticeship program winter in Los Angeles, women in non-traditional employment roles that is a pre-apprenticeship program specifically for women um, and they expose folks to a bunch of different trades. Um, but what's nice about apprenticeship is that it's very structured. It's so it's, it's uh, um, there's a clear learning progression. There's clear how much you're gonna make along that learning progression. The expectations are really clear. And so I think we do need more of that in terms of having like just formal learning pathways. And at grade we are looking at, um, or at least investigating or researching what our options are for de developing an employer sponsored apprenticeship um, at grid, um, if that's possible or feasible. Um, so, um, yeah, I think we're going to be hearing about apprenticeships more and more. Great, thank you. All right, let's move on to our next question. Um, this is an important one. It is on intersectionality. So basically the question is that, what is it like really to overcome challenges, not only as a woman, but as a woman of color? So kind of the challenges that I ran into, you know, being, um, it was, so being both, you know, like a Native American and also a part of the LGBTQI community, it was, it was kind of like a process of myself and it kind of challenged me um, mentally. And of course, like at the moment with my mentors, there was a lot of times I kind of had to keep encouraging myself keep you know telling myself these positive things and how that looked for me was one like I would sometimes so I got a dog you know I got a I got a little fur baby who's like my my main motivator with me but definitely you know keeping myself in good hopes and you know just realize and kind of like what Frida had mentioned earlier just take it day by day and you know the and don't let a bad yesterday ruin a good today and so even though the challenges that we're going to that are ahead, you know, they they can't all be there for the rest of our lifetime. That's great. Thank you. Any other? I can add. Um, yeah, I am a woman of color and, and just on, and also on top of that, another identity is that I'm a smaller bodied person, too. Like, I, I take it as a compliment when people are like, oh, you're bigger than I thought you or you're smaller than I thought you'd be. I'm only five foot one, y'all, um, in construction. Um, and so in terms of like, but when I was in the field, I trained like an athlete um, in terms of like wanting to build physical resilience. Um, I think it's important that, um, yeah, we build physical resilience, emotional resilience, if you're going to go into the field. Um, and I just wanted my team to be able to rely on me. Um, and so, um, yeah, and so I'd say in terms of intersectionality and, the, and then I'm just in a really privileged place now where I just surround myself. Like I choose to be in spaces that are like women led, women of color led, like that's where you're gonna find me. So, um, or people of color led. Um, so, um, yeah, but I, I recognize that that's, that's a privilege to do so. And I'm based in Los Angeles. And so um, I have a lot more control over kind of my environment. That's great. Thank you. 
All I um all I have to add is um I mean I I spent part of my life growing up in a predominantly white um community and so um I did like I you know I handled a lot of uh different kind of feelings you know about who I was and everything and it isn't until now and I I suppose this is actually um somewhat related to what Anna said is you know I I've since moved and I've become part of a much more inclusive and diverse community. And in doing so, I've actually like come to like embrace like, you know, who I am and like being a woman of color and I've learned to like appreciate it and kind of, um, I don't know, that's really like helped me overcome some challenges. It's just kind of appreciating who I am and um, being confident in all of that, so. That's great. Thank you for your responses. Let's see if we can do another one here. I'm actually going to group three questions together um, because it has to do with um, basically navigating the job site. Um, the questions are, you know, how do you command respect, enforce order on a job site? And also related, how do you handle being micromanaged or have you been punished for anything that you've brought up or when you've tried to step up? So any, any tips for how to navigate the workspace? So how I kind of, you know, like navigated the workspace whenever I went into like the private sector uh, installation was I kind of, you know, like I took a step back and kind of just like analyzed where everybody was, and how everybody was moving and kind of figured out, you know, like where if they were on the, they were on the roof and they were trying to, you know, like locate the rafters, we can get the job done. One, if I prepped the solar modules and got them ready and created the microgrid map. And whenever I was being, I think the only kind of um, really backhanded I got was whenever I wanted to wear the safety harness on, wanted to use a safety harness. And they were kind of just just being uh, downplaying me because one, I wanted to be safe. Two, it was, at a, it was on a pretty high roof. And then three, um, they were kind of, you know, more used to freely moving around. So they weren't really... So they basically didn't want to either put their step up higher above my lifeline or acknowledge that I was actually, you know, like wearing one because one, if we should all be wearing one. And so kind of being micromanaged and being told what to do, I would kind of, you know, like, so kind of try to let them, you know, go ahead, you take the lead. And while they were still kind of, you know, like trying to tell me how to do my job, I walked away to go ahead and do something else. And so they turned around, they're like, where'd you go? I was like, oh, it seemed like you had it out of control. And it was a little bit immature, but it was kind of me um, giving them a taste of their own medicine in a subtle way. That's great. Well, that's really helpful. Well, we are at time. I know we started a few minutes late, so I want to ask one very brief question before wrapping up um, and maybe have a very quick response. This is coming from the audience, but an inspirational or memorable moment from your career, anything that's sort of to leave folks on an inspired note. I can go. Um... So before pandemic hit, we had our last big um, we build or women in solar um, retreat or um, big event. It was on a commercial build. Um, and again, shouting out Britt who helped organize that in Colorado. Um, but yeah, it was a hundred um, folks who participated over two days. And I wanna say it was like a 50 kilowatt project. Like it wasn't like a small project and we like built it in two days. And I just remember looking around being like, this is not happening anywhere else in the world. Like, this is just awesome. Like, it's just a fic a, like a mixture of like entry level folks, seasoned folks. And we were just, I think Frida said this, like just getting the job done. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, like I, I, still, I still cherish cherish that moment. That's awesome. Anyone else? So I guess a memorable moment for me 
it was back in, I believe it was back in October. Um, I got invited out to go ahead and do an install training down on the uh, Yankton Reservation back in South Dakota. And it was for an, an elder. And so I guess at that moment, you know, we all, it was, it was basically an indigenous, an indigenous, an all indigenous team. And we had people that were on the roof. We had people that was, you know, on the ground. We got really in depth about how we were going to move forward and getting the system up. And <clears throat> and it was just like a really good feeling whenever one we got the panels were on, we cleaned up the job site. And whenever like we took the picture, it felt really empowering and encouraging to know like you know, we had, there was males, there was females there. We were all of different ages and we were all free you know, came from different generations, but yet what brought us together was, was solar PV and wanting to help the community. And so that's kind of what I tell myself to stay motivated and to keep moving on because what I'm replicating here, I wish to take this same model back to my reservation in South Dakota. That's beautiful. Thank you. What a great picture. That's amazing. And Frida, do you have a final thought? We'll wrap us up here. It's hard to follow those two. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, this is actually related to um, what Anna had mentioned about um, RISE. Um, there's a Los Angeles chapter, and I actually went to a, um, a meeting for that. And um, I highly suggest, you know, getting involved. Um, like Anna said, you know, with however you can, because going there and getting to meet, I was so nervous, but getting to meet all of those women and like, there were still men there too. Like it was just a very supportive, um, inclusive little meeting and everything. And just getting to see how powerful these women were, you know, doing, starting, you know, a company or, you know, going off on their own, leaving their comfortable job and going somewhere and getting involved in solar or just really anything. Like it was just, it was very inspiring. And I just, I, I felt like so proud to be a woman and just like working towards what I wanted to do, um, no matter the challenges. So uh, yes, highly recommend <laughs> getting involved with RISE. So that was it for me. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Frida. It has been so wonderful to talk with you today, to hear your experiences, to get inspired with you, and to see that there's so much ready to just, you know, happen, <laughs> so much more building that's on the way, and in an inclusive way. There's so many plans, so many folks just like you out there, I can see from the chat, who is dedicated to um, expanding the workforce in an inclusive way. And yeah, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. And everyone who's watching, we will have a recording. So be on the lookout for that. And also for next month's grid talk, we'll be um, circulating some information on that soon in the coming weeks. All right. Thank you all again. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much.